Good morning, everyone. We're thrilled to welcome you here to the White House for today's early STEM learning symposium. My name is Roberto Rodriguez. I serve here on the Domestic Policy Council. I am Deputy Assistant to the President for Education. Uh, we're so excited to be with you today, to have you here, and to uh, have a discussion throughout the day here to, that brings together two issues that are central to our administration's education agenda, two issues that are of great importance to the President himself. Uh, and uh, those issues are high quality early education and the advancement of learning in STEM in science, technology, engineering, and math. So we have an exciting day. We'll explore the latest research and evidence on learning in STEM. We'll explore the federal investment in STEM and opportunities for greater investment and expansion there. We will address inclusive practices and strategies for how to do better for our students with disabilities, for our English learners, uh, as we engage them in STEM. And we will, most of all, spark new discussions uh, across the day about the next wave of innovation uh, and engagement in STEM for our youngest learners. You know, at the beginning of our administration, President Obama set a goal to move our country from the middle back to the top of the pack internationally in STEM. Uh, and that requires a strategy to set higher standards and expectations for science and math in our schools, uh, to really rethink teaching and learning, uh, put in place a rigorous curriculum around STEM in our, in our schools and in our classrooms and our early learning programs, and also think about the informal experiences uh, in STEM for our students, uh, and to make sure that, most of all, uh, our learners have a great teacher. Uh, and so that is why the President put forth in 2011 a goal to prepare 100,000 new excellent uh, teachers in STEM over the course of 10 years and why in 2012 he launched a new uh, STEM Master Teacher Corps to recognize uh, and reward some of our best and brightest in this field. Uh, so today's summit takes place with that policy backdrop and really underscores, underscores the point that our race to the top as a country in STEM must begin early. Part of a high quality learning experience, whether in a child care setting, whether in a preschool classroom or a Head Start program, means having access to high quality STEM learning. And so it's up to us to set a strong foundation for our children and expose them early to STEM across all of their settings, regardless of where they are, at home, in, in a formal program, in parks and museums, uh, in informal learning environments across their communities. And it really shouldn't be hard to foster that love for STEM learning early. Uh, as any parent or teacher well knows, children are born curious. They're born natural scientists and explorers. And so our imperative and bottom line is that as we know children are active learners, our job is to make sure that we provide an active curriculum and an active set, ex a set of experiences that really can match their imagination in STEM. So we're thrilled to have you all with us today. Uh, earlier this year, we set forth a challenge uh, to uh, work with our administration uh, to explore new opportunities to address STEM learning and engagement uh, across settings. We've had over 200 submissions and responses to those challenge. A number of those will be highlighted today. It's a collective call to action to strengthen and support STEM early learning. Uh, and we're especially thrilled that many of the commitments consider and put at the forefront equity uh, in access to early STEM learning. Uh, together, we need to make sure that each and every child, boys and girls alike, no matter the zip code they live in, the color of their skin, or the language they speak, has equal access to STEM learning. And we have to really be intentional about realizing that vision. And that's part of the conversation we want to have today. So it's really my pleasure again to welcome you here. And it's a great honor to introduce to you a huge champion for equity and STEM uh, and a huge champion for education who leads our administration's work in this area, our Secretary of Education, Dr. John King. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Roberto, for the warm introduction. Thank you all for being here for this important conversation today. It's been an exciting 
a uh, couple of STEM focused weeks for us here with the uh, White House Science Fair, which was fantastic. And then I had the opportunity to head out to uh, Springdale, Arkansas to see the work that they're doing both on pre-K, which I visited before, and the work that they're doing on computer science and how they are connecting uh, those two things as they think about early STEM experiences that will lead students to long-term success in computer science. Uh, Today's conversation is important, as Roberto mentioned, because it draws together two important themes from throughout the administration, the importance of investing in early learning. And we have been clear from the beginning that early learning has a huge return on investment for the country. And we all know the research, an eight to one, nine to one return on investment. When some think of it as an expense, we would argue it's not an expense, it's an investment, a long-term investment that realizes savings in better long-term academic outcomes, better long-term health outcomes, and better long-term success in the workforce. We have that, that idea of the importance of investing in early learning, and then the importance of STEM to the future, not only of our economy, but of our democracy as we grapple with questions around green energy or questions around water quality. STEM is an important factor in our civic discourse and how we think about how we improve life for all of our citizens. And so this event really draws together these two important themes and builds on work that has taken place over the last seven and a half years. We think about the work that's happened through Invest in Us and the leadership of the first five years fund and Chris Perry and the work that's happening to mobilize uh, efforts across the country to invest in early learning. We think about the fact that last year more than 30 states committed to increase their investments in early learning. We've really galvanized a set of investments at the local, state, and federal level. Uh, there are many leaders in the room. We could probably spend all morning recognizing the contributions of folks across the room to this effort. I want to particularly recognize the Heising Simons Foundation uh, for their support for investing in early education and also in particular in early math. I want to recognize the National Association for the Education of Young Children for their leadership across a wide range of issues, including the important question of ensuring that as folks approach STEM in the early years, they do so in a way that makes sense developmentally for our youngest learners and that takes advantages of opportunities to create joyful environments of play and creativity. I uh, certainly want to recognize all of our partners in the room from the uh, Department of Health and Human Service, which is our close partner in the work on Race to Top Early Learning Challenge and Preschool Development Grants and STEM Early Learning. Uh, certainly our partners at the Department of Agriculture, the National Science Science Foundation, uh, folks from NASA, I believe, are in the room. So many important partners in this, in this work. What I hope we will accomplish today, that you will accomplish today, it's really three important goals. One is to talk about what we know, what we're seeing, what, ex what excellent examples we have around the country that we can lift up and bring to scale. I hope there's conversation today about what we need to still learn and a real research agenda for STEM and early learning and clarity across our community about what we can learn about what works, not just for some kids, but what works for all kids. What are the right smart interventions to create positive STEM experiences in English language learner classrooms, in dual language classrooms, in classrooms that are inclusive of students with disabilities? How do we make sure that access to quality STEM early learning experience is possible for all students in all zip codes? And the research agenda to make sure that that happens at a high degree of quality. And third, how do we use the conversation today to continue to build momentum? And we want to create really a community of practice, a community of shared learning across the room and across the initiatives in the room. You know, as, as I was pre preparing for today, I asked my daughters, I have a nine-year-old and a 12-year-old, and there are a couple other kids who uh, walk to school with my kids, and so they're all gathered in the morning. So I asked one morning about uh, early learning STEM experiences, and every face lit up, which is not always the case. <laughs> Parents in the room know that it's not always the case at seven in the morning, but faces lit up with lots of examples of things that, that the girls uh, remembered from their early learning STEM experiences, from growing plants to examining butterflies and drawing pictures of them to read alouds that they, that they heard to building with blocks. Uh, lots of experiences that 
um, not only they remember it as learning opportunities, but as joyful experiences in their early learning classroom. Uh, comments about the, the water table or the chicks that were grown in the classroom and, and hatch. My 12-year-old remembered that they, they, were, they had an incubator for eggs that they were going to hatch, and she was absent on the day that they hatched. And she still, she's still quite sad about that. Uh, but it was a reminder to me that this, this, this work on early STEM experience is not just about ensuring a strong academic foundation, it's about the joy that comes in learning about and coming to understand how the world works. Uh, but then there are these very clear academic benefits that we have to celebrate and recognize and build on. Uh, we know that students who get quality early learning experiences in the STEM fields do better in elementary school and on into the secondary level and later study. Uh, we know that there is strong evidence that the vocabulary of science and of the natural world is essential to students' long-term success and that there is a real achievement gap for our low-income students as they come into the early grades if they haven't had those experiences. So as we think about how we close our achievement gaps and our very real diversity gaps in the STEM fields, part of how we do that is ensuring quality early STEM experiences so that students have that foundation of vocabulary and background knowledge that will help them as readers and also help their success in the STEM fields. Uh, we also know that there's a strong connection between arts and STEM, and we see that in the earliest years. And we need to be smart about making STEAM more than just a slogan. We've got to be thoughtful about how we support teachers in connecting across science and the arts. I was struck, uh, one, of the, one of the girls in this conversation about their STEM experiences, talking about the butterflies that an art teacher brought into the art classroom. But she thought of it as a STEM experience. But what they were learning about was, yes, about butterflies, but they were also uh, doing art about the butterflies and drawing pictures and understanding the parts of the, of the butterfly and the differences between them. Uh, those are powerful experiences. That's how we help make STEAM a reality, those thoughtful, integrated learning experiences. As we do this work, we must, of course, focus on issues of equity, as Roberto mentioned. Uh, I was struck reading a comment from William Wolfe, the past president of the National Academy of Engineering, who said, the quality of engineering is affected directly by the degree of diversity in the engineering team for that project. And that's a powerful statement about the, that, about the idea that diversity improves outcomes. And we see that tremendous amount of emerging research. We see that in higher education, in the business sector, that diverse teams produce better solutions. Uh, but I don't have to tell you, when we look across the STEM fields, we don't always see diverse teams. We don't always see diverse leadership. We have a real underrepresentation of African American and Latino communities in the STEM fields. And we've got to work to close those gaps. And we've got to make sure that as we approach this work, we are laser focused on our highest need students and what's happening in their early learning classrooms. And we know that, that early learning the results from early learning come with quality, but too often our low-income communities, our communities that are immigrant communities are not getting those high-quality early learning experiences. They may be getting early learning. It may even be funded with public dollars, but is it high-quality? Is it integrating STEM in thoughtful and meaningful ways? And so we've got to make sure that as we do this work, we are focused on equitable access. We're focused on making sure there's the professional development for all of our educators around how to do STEM well in their classrooms. Uh, and we've got to deal with challenging structural questions. You know, when folks are poorly compensated, it is often hard to get folks with the prior preparation that we would want in the early learning classroom. So we've got to confront these issues of proper compensation proper compensation, not just for teachers, but also for center directors and principals. How do we ensure, as we see more and more pre-Ks in elementary schools, how do we ensure that elementary principals have learned about how pre-K is different, how preschool is different, and the different kinds of support and mentoring that their teachers need. So we've got to make sure that professional development is a commitment to not only supporting some, but all of our early learning teachers so that we can get to equitable outcomes. The new law, the Every Student Succeeds Act, gives us some powerful new opportunities. It commits 
the country to a continued investment in preschool. That was a priority for the President and certainly for Senator Murray as we work through the Every Student Succeeds Act development. It creates new flexibility for states to broaden their definition of educational excellence to incorporate science. Too often we know in the No Child Left Behind era, schools, including in early learning, narrowed their focus and lost sight of the role that science and social studies and the arts and learning a second language can play in students' long-term success. So there's new flexibility for states and districts to be smarter about how they define quality. And there are new resources. The Title IV grant program will be able to support uh, high-quality STEM experiences for students, particularly in high-need schools. The President has proposed nearly doubling the funding for Title IV in, the, in his 2017 budget. That has the potential to drive new opportunities for students. Uh, then Every Student Succeeds Act also includes a version of the Promised Neighborhoods idea, the idea that we've got to powerfully leverage the efforts not just of schools but community-based organizations in support of student success. And there's a role for STEM to play there as a, as a support outside of school through strong partnerships with museums, aquariums, uh, research labs. Right? There's an opportunity to leverage other partner institutions and many in the room are doing just that. Uh, one example I can think of, uh, before coming to the department, I was the state chief in, in New York, the Commissioner of Education in New York, and I can recall visiting um, the Middle Country Public Library on Long Island, where they have created in this library a natural, uh, what they called a nature explorium, uh, natural exploration space with uh, water areas and building areas and arts areas and opportunities for students to have uh, what I would characterize as messy fun uh, in this space in a library. And so seeing libraries as a part of the potential partnerships I think is, is critical to our work moving forward. We've got great momentum, really proud of the, of the over 200 commitments that have been made as part of this effort. Uh, hugely excited about the folks in this room and the things that you've committed to. Uh, just to call out a few powerfully important work of 100K and 10 on ensuring that we have the pipeline of STEM educators that we need, including at the early learning uh, level. Uh, excited about the work that the Massachusetts Department of Early Education is doing, particularly on professional development for STEM, and that I think can be a model for other states as they think about how states can lead on early STEM education. Uh, excited about the work that Learning Point Alaska is doing, particularly focused on Alaska Native students. Uh, we had, last year we had the highest graduation rate we've ever had as a country at 82 percent. The one subgroup that did not make progress, we saw big gains, African American students, Latino students, low income students, the one student population that did not make progress, Native students. And that is, an, that is I think, uh, an indictment of the legacy of American history and, and, and the treatment of Native communities, um, not just 200 years ago or 100 years ago, but still today. And so the commitment to try and ensure that our Native youth have access to high quality early STEM experiences I think is an important one. Uh, and, and also want to call out the Teaching Institute for Excellence in STEM and their early childhood fab labs, which I like just as a name, and it's fun to say. Um, but the idea that we can create maker spaces that are inspiring for students and that give them hands-on STEM learning experiences, again, connecting STEM with joy in learning. So all of these are great examples of the kind of work that we hope to see expanded across the country. Uh, we are also issuing today, as you probably saw as you came in, Let's Talk, Read, and Sing about STEM, a uh, set of tips and, and tip sheets that we've developed with Health and Human Services to support educators as they think about great ways to integrate STEM. So I'll close with this. Uh, when I think about STEM heroes, uh, my, I know a hero for me, and even more so for my, for my wife, uh, is Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, and uh, yeah, and sometimes, you know, when your spouse has a, has a hero like that, it can sometimes be disconcerting. <laughs> she's, she's very excited about Neil deGrasse Tyson. And I say, I'm a nerd too. But at any rate, he, he made a, he, he uh, 
said of his experience growing up, I've known that I wanted to do astrophysics since I was nine years old, which is impressive in and of itself, uh, my first visit to the Hayden Planetarium, which also, I think, gives us a, a signal of the power of those hands-on lived experiences. So I got to see how the world around me reacted to my expression of these ambitions. And all I can say is the fact that I wanted to be a scientist was hands down the path of most resistance through the forces of society. I looked to become something that was outside the paradigms of expectation. Fortunately, my depth of interest was so deep and so fuel enriched that every one of these curveballs I was thrown and fences built in front of me and hills that I had to climb, I just reached for more fuel and I kept going. And so I think of this as a conversation about giving our young people, all of our young people, regardless of their race or the zip code they live in or their family's income or the language they speak at home or their immigration status, giving all of our young people that fuel in their early years to inspire their passion for the STEM fields, whether they one day become a STEM professional or not. Inspiring their passion and interest and engagement in learning about STEM will make them not only better prepared for college and careers, but better prepared to be productive members of society and to contribute to solving our greatest challenges as a country. So thank you for what you do. Thank you for your commitment, uh, not only to STEM early learning, uh, but to equity and excellence and the role of education in ensuring the quality of opportunity in our country. Thanks so much. If John doesn't make you proud of this administration, nobody will. Was that not an incredible speech? John, you said everything we wanted to see. That's why we wanted to go early, is to give him more time. You can see he gets it about STEM, about early learning. Uh, he had good talking points, but that was from his heart, so thank you. We're excited about the next panel. Uh, like Linda taught us, we wanted to start with the research, so Lisa Guernsey uh, is going to moderate it. We're so fortunate that Lisa is here. She, uh, Michael Levine and Lisa have written an incredible book. I hope you have read it and bought it. I have bought it and want to get it signed at some point. Um, talk, I mean, tap, click, read. And we need to talk about STEM too, right? Uh, Lisa's going to moderate our panel, and if you'll come on up, you, Lisa's from the New America Foundation. She's our moderator. Then we have Doug Clements, and I hope you know Doug's good work around early math. and early engineering, we have Debbie Sterling from Goldie Blocks. Thank you for what you're doing. I have some of those at uh, my house. Uh, early science, we have Daryl Greenfield from the University of Miami. And in early computer science, we have Marina Barris from Tufts. And uh, Pat Cool is here from the University of Washington to talk about science and neuroscience of learning. Uh, you all have almost an hour. I think John cut into a little bit of your time, but we're delighted that you all would take time to get us off to a good start. We do have a timer over there, and she will keep us on time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Libby. Uh, it's a real honor to be moderating this panel. I'm going to jump right in so that we can really kind of get to the, the questions around research. Um, and so we won't, we won't start with too many introductions. I do think that uh, Secretary King laid out a beautiful task for us to really ensure that we start with research, we start with the evidence, and then we build from there. So what we're going to do is take the first moment here, the first, say, uh, 15 to 20 minutes, to ask each of our, um, spear, our panelists here to spend just three minutes to tell us what research is telling them works. What do we know that's working for children in math and in science and technology, engineering, um, and in their cognitive and social growth? And, uh, and if you'd like, you can stand at the podium to give those three minutes, or if you'd like to, to sit, that's fine. And then we're going to launch into a much deeper and richer conversation. So I'm going to start with Doug uh, Clements. It's um, a thrill to have, have Doug with us here. And uh, so Doug, the question is, is for you on the floor. What works when it comes to math and young children? Thanks. So I have less than five minutes to tell you five ways that early mathematics is really surprising. First of all, it's surprising how deep and broad 
young children's thinking can be about mathematics. Take one example, Justin was asked, what's the biggest number, Justin, five or eight or six? And he said eight. And the interviewer was about to pass on and he said, well, because, because five is like this, one, two, three, four, five, and six is one more here, and then for eight you have to go two more. He not only knew the sequence of numbers, he had that number sense, that quantitative sense, multiple representations of these kind of numbers. Second, surprising, is how predictive early math is. Early math is hands down, the best predictor of later school success in a variety of studies. It's shockingly predictive. Early math is cognitively fundamental. Third, this is a surprise to many educators. We need to support them. In one study, for example, uh, educators were shown a subtraction problem and said, your preschool kids are ready for kindergarten now. Out of your class, how many kids could solve that problem? The average was one. They thought maybe one kid could solve it. No, 10 could solve that problem. So when we underestimate what kids are capable of, how can we provide challenging but achievable kind of task for them? We need to up our game in how much we share with teachers and the support we provide for them. Fourth surprise, we know a lot about how to support kids' early learning, how it happens. We, we have developed, Julie Saram and I have developed learning trajectories, research-based kind of levels of thinking. Just like kids uh, crawl before they walk, walk before they run, when you have a certain mathematical goal, there's steps you take to get there. And we understand those steps, the levels of thinking through which kids pass. When you plan curricula, activities, professional development, with teachers understanding those steps, then they can actually start where the child is and give them activities that'll help each child get to the next level of thinking. Fifth, not only do we find that if you follow these kind of learning trajectories, you get real serious gains in early mathematics learning and thinking, but it also generates transfer to other areas. For instance, we found in NSF and ISF funded pro IES funded projects that um, uh, not only do we get good gains in mathematics, but kids' oral language, separate from mathematics, grows as well. And we get transfer to self-regulation or executive function skills. So this is what we think is possible. Surprising things, number one, broad and deep mathematics. Number two, it's amazingly predictive. Early math, kindergarten entry math, is the best predictor of whether kids finish high school and start college. Number three, it's a surprise to too many educators. We have to educate them about what kids are capable of. Number four, using learning trajectories is powerful. And five, it transfers to language. So I'll end with one last story. Here's a kindergarten. His name was Andrew. I was interviewing him, see how much he had learned from our Building Blocks project. And he said, and I, the question was, Andrew, ah, just you're, you pretend you're on the telephone and you're talking to one of your friends and they don't know what a triangle is. And he said, doesn't know what a triangle was. And I said, yeah, just, just, uh, uh, <laughs> if he didn't know what a triangle was, what would you tell him? And he looks at me and he says, does he know what a rhombus is? <laughs> Nobody had asked me that before, so it kind of threw me. And I said, okay, he knows what a rhombus is. Then it's easy. Take the top of the rhombus, fold it on the bottom of the rhombus, and that'll make a triangle, he said. And, you know, he should put it up on his wall because he really should know what a triangle was. It's a very, very, and I said, okay, Andrew, maybe. You, but let me, what if he didn't know what a rhombus was? Okay, uh, take a piece of paper, I tell him. Start in the top of the middle of the paper and draw a line straight down to the middle of the side. And then another line to the middle about him. And then another line, and I did what you're not supposed to do in a clinical interview. I stopped him and said, to draw a triangle? And he looked at me kind of disdainfully and said, no, to do a rhombus. Then he can do what I told him to do already. <laughs> so, so he did what mathematicians love. He reduced the problem to a previously solved problem. <laughs> And then, most importantly, he showed what we want to see, this kind of motivation and engagement in young children, because at the end he says, is this going to be on my report to my parents because I'm doing really good? <laughs> so that's what we can see if we follow the research in early mathematics. Thanks. Morning. I never go, like going after Doug. He's so great. <laughs> 
But actually, I'm glad that I'm going third. And after, t after having you listen to Secretary King and listen to Doug, um, I'm just going to sort of review what the two of them said because we're a little bit behind in our understanding of, of science and the research on science is not quite as advanced as it is in math. But uh, Dr. King really sort of reviewed why science is really the ideal domain for young children uh, as a focus for their early learning. We don't know as much because our theories, Piaget, for example, told us that kids of this age really cannot do science. Their hypothetical thinking is really not at a point yet where they can do it. So most of the field ignored science until later ages. But now, clearly, what we, what we know and understand is that young children are indeed highly capable of doing science, early science. And it's the ideal domain for them because, as Dr. King was pointing out, this is the stuff of what children are most interested in. They are trying to make sense of and understand how their world works. And when you think about what they're trying to understand, it's the main content areas of science. So life science, kids want to know, how come my clothes don't fit anymore? Um, what um, happens when you grow plants? So this is really life science. They're interested in the properties of objects. What sinks, what floats, what rolls, what doesn't roll, what slides. These are the properties of physical science. They're interested in changes. They notice, for example, that leaves change color and they fall off. They notice the stars, the sun. This is earth and space science. And little kids love to build, and building is a wonderful activity for them because they're not concerned that things fall down. They just try to build it so it's more stable. So when you think about what the kids are most interested in understanding, it's the content areas of science. And they can clearly do this. And when you go into classrooms and you watch children perform um, in, in their free time, the teachers apologize that they're not doing science, but the kids actually are doing science the whole time. What happens, though, is on their own, children really can't get past a certain level of science understanding. And what we really need and what the research is showing is that it's critical for the educators to really get involved and understand what children are actually capable of doing, as Doug has pointed out, and how much children can actually learn and actually how capable they are of scaffolding and providing that sort of learning for young children. So our, our main task around early science is really getting the educators to see the science that's actually going on in their classrooms to support it and to provide the sort of scaffolding that young children need. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, young children are very interested in objects around water, what sinks and what floats. And you know, as, as babies are playing in their bathtub, uh, there's always a sink and float activity that's happening in the classroom. And if you just let children sort of play on their own, they're going to take a whole bunch of objects. They're going to drop them in water. Some are going to sink. Some are going to float. They might remember what particular object sank, what particular object float. But they really aren't sort of getting a general sense of what's important. What a teacher can do in trying to structure that activity is choose some materials to focus on a particular learning objective that she wants to emphasize and she wants to make visible for the children. So for example, she could do something simply like taking some Play-Doh, have kids weigh it so we have the math component that comes in so everyone has exactly the same amount of Play-Doh, ask them to turn it into the shape of a ball, look at all the balls, and get the kids to predict what is going to happen when I take this ball of clay and put it in water. And as Dr. King says, the important thing about doing science with young kids is you don't want to show them. You want them to actually get engaged and do the science themselves. So you spend a lot of time having the children make, make the balls, predict what's going to happen. You can count how many children decide it's going to sink, how many children it's decide it's going to float. And when you watch that activity, the children have good ideas. They make predictions. Some will say that sinks and they have a good idea why they think it might sink or why they might float. And what you see is that all of those balls just sink. So the children have learned something. Now the teacher says, let's think about how we can take this particular object and change its shape so maybe it'll float. Any suggestions, any ideas? And kids come up with ideas of things that floats. Boats will come up as an idea so the teacher can say, well, let's take the piece of Play-Doh and turn it into the shape of a boat. And the kids do that. Most of them will now float and there's a hole in it, it'll sink, but then the child will try to figure out, well, why did mine sink? Uh, fix the hole, and then it will end up floating. And what the teacher is doing is she'll structure that activity and actually talk about in the beginning what she's doing. And she's demonstrated that what the children are learning now is that it matters what the shape is. And this gets to one of the big ideas that's important in the new K-12 framework, which is that there's the idea around structure and function. So structure 
tells you something about the function. So you can take the same object and you, cha and you can change its, its structure, and now it's going to lead to another function. So the same little ball is going to sink. Same piece of Play-Doh is going to sink when you make it into a ball. It's going to float when you turn it in, into the shape of a boat. Why this is so critical <clears throat> is because we now have evidence that at kindergarten entry, we already have these sorts of differences that Dr. Ting King was talking about in terms of equity. Children from poor, poor and low-income families do much, much poorer at kindergarten entry. Dual language kids do much, much poorer at kindergarten entry. And we have longitudinal data going all the way now to eighth grade. And those differences at kindergarten predict what the kids are going to look like in eighth grade. So it's critical that we start very, very early. It's a matter of getting the teachers to sort of see and understand what the kids are already doing, support that learning for them, and get high quality science education and include the math and the, and the language and all the other areas. And as Doug, Doug has pointed out, we're now beginning to see some of the same evidence that science produces better executive function, better self-regulation, self better approaches to learning. So although math is the best predictor, I'm waiting until we have more research and then I'm going <laughs> to trump. <laughs> Trump Doug and show us that science that's doing it first. So hi everyone. So I was asked by Lisa to first start with this idea of computational thinking, because I guess not everyone here is familiar with the notion of computational thinking. It feels like it's a new thing, you know, you have President Obama being the president that codes and we want coding for all and we hear a lot about coding. However, the idea of computational thinking is pretty old. You know, Seymour Papert, my mentor back at MIT, coined it around the 70s, where computers were these big machines. And today, it's really picking up. It's taking a long time to pick up this idea. And basically, what we mean is engaging in some of the very powerful ideas and some of the skills and some of the habits of mind that computer scientists have. What does it mean for early childhood? One big keyword, sequencing. So understanding that logic matters, that there is an order on how we do things, that when the order is broken, it doesn't work. We can fix the problem, we can go back, we can debug, and we can understand how to create a sequence of steps that matter. This has implications beyond STEM. This has implications of how I tie my shoes, how do I dress in the morning. It's very, very much the beginning of understanding to see the world in a logical way. Um, of course, then we have, we know that sequencing is a predictor for uh, math success later on and for literacy. So I cringe every time I hear the word STEM because the, the beautiful thing about computational thinking and the beautiful thing about this field is that really has an, uh, a spread into everything else that we learn because computational thinking is really a way of thinking. And if we learn how to think in new ways, we can learn how to see the world in new ways, and we can learn how to express ourselves in new ways. And this is really what research is telling us. It's a lot brand new research than math. We've been, we are just starting to understand these learning trajectories because we are just starting now to have the developmentally appropriate programming environments for young kids. We cannot see them, a four and a five year old in front of a C++ or a Java, or even a logo that was done for a, you know, eight and 10 year olds. So with NSF funding in my lab at Tufts, we have developed, I think, the first two big programming languages that are having wide impact into the world. One is Scratch Junior, and it's really free and available, and we launched it two years ago, two million users all over the world. And the other is Keyboard Robotics, which is you program with blocks, no need of screens. You have the art, you have to bring the playground into the programming class. And I, I believe that in the research, in, in this field, you really started to see how computer science has to be part of this conversation in early childhood, because we need to see more and more programming environments that remind us of playground types of activities that invite dancing and singing and playfulness into the world of programming. So coding is important for computational thinking. Why? Because it's a way to express, to make tangible your computational thinking. You cannot think in our thinking without thinking about something, Seymour Samir say. And that something is the world of programming. You know, right now we want people talk about coding. I love the world programming language because language reminds us of the relationship of thinking with literacy. 
And with the language, we create a world. With the language, we understand the world, but with the language, we also express ourselves. And that's the ultimate goal of bringing computer science into your early childhood. It's great if these kids are gonna grow up to become the future scientists and engineers and of the world, but in today's world, where every object around us is an object that has been programmed, that it's a smart object. You go to the, to the to wash your hands on the sink, you put your hands, water comes. There's a sensor there. Someone has programmed that sensor. We need to be able to open that and understand how is this world human-made today working, and the only way we're gonna understand it is not by reading if we're in early childhood, it's by doing. And therefore, we need more and more developmentally appropriate tools out there uh, to be able to learn in the way young children learn. So I'm gonna close with an example about uh, this. So for example, with keyboard robots, we have a beautiful curriculum that we've piloted all over the world, and actually Singapore is leading the way, and I wish the US would follow, in a nationwide curriculum for early childhood on robotics in this case, and we're doing the research. If anyone is interested, I'm happy to share all the stuff that's been happening there, amazing. And so this curriculum is dances around the world. I'm originally from Argentina, I love dancing, although I'm a computer scientist, you know, they come together and there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of learning with your body. We know that, we learn math concepts, we learn, the same is true for, for programming. And so in this curriculum, children study a particular region of the world, and then they study the dance. There's a lot of math. There's a lot of prediction. There's a lot of sequencing. And they go ahead and program these robots to dance to the rhythm of that particular region of the world. And at the end, we have a performance, not a competition, where there is movement, there's singing. And this is a completely different approach. And I like to use that example because it's not your traditional Lego robotics competition that might work later on. But in early childhood, we were trying to foster and promote socialization and cooperation and that's something that we need to teach and learn, we wanna have more of these kinds of experiences that really bring everything together. So if you have to remember one thing, of, and one thing that I just said, I would say, think of coding as the new literacy and think about all the things that we know about research that work for literacy. And this is really a path. I would say coding and computational thinking are closer to reading and writing than what we think. So. Hi, everyone. So as one of the uh, very few uh, women in my engineering program at Stanford, it was something that really, really bothered me. Um, growing up as a little girl, I never had any interest in engineering. It wasn't until high school, my senior year, my math teacher encouraged me to try it in college. And um, I actually didn't know what engineering was. I thought it was a dirty old man train driver. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but after I found my passion in engineering, I really became obsessed with getting girls interested in engineering. And so today, what I'm going to talk with you about um, is how the research that I did influenced the design of Goldie Blocks, which is my solution to getting girls interested in engineering. Uh, the first thing that I was trying to figure out in this quest to get girls into engineering is what age. Um, initially, everybody told me middle school. That's the problem, you gotta hit middle school. But the research that I did actually showed that kids start to form their gender identity around three and four. And I thought, well, if at around three and four, this is when girls and boys are kind of figuring out what's appropriate for a girl and what's appropriate for a boy, I actually think that's where the problem starts. So initially I decided I wanted to focus much younger than middle school. Uh, the next part of my research that I did was, well, what are some precursors to engineering? And one of the things that uh, showed up was the development of motor and spatial skills. And I found that construction toys and video games are great kind of early builders of spatial skills. But those were predominantly boy play patterns, at least in the toy industry anyway. And so I sort of scratched my head wondering why is it, there, why is it that there's th these um, long aisles and aisles of the blue aisle at the toy store filled with construction toys and girls get the tea sets and the princesses. That didn't seem very fair. And so uh, I started researching construction toys. And I found a couple of interesting things. Um, one, I talked with uh, after school educators and asked them how girls played with construction toys differently than boys. And many of the nonprofit educators actually told me that girls were more interested in playing with um, parts that were more sort of like arts and crafts, sort of things with textures and round edges that they weren't as interested in the hard edged rectilinear primary colored toys, which was interesting to me. So I took that insight and I used that when I was developing my own construction set. 
I was inspired by the arts and crafts style and common household objects. The other thing that I found in my research was that I'd noticed boys would take construction toys, build them up as high as they could, and then usually smash them against the wall. And that was fun for them. Uh, but when I saw girls playing with them, I would find that girls actually would like to build stories. So they'd put something together, and then they'd want to know the narrative and the context. They'd want to know who the characters were, and, and what, where we were building, and where are we, and what's the point, and are we fixing something or solving a problem. And so um, this idea of storytelling really fascinated me, and it was something that seemed really missing from all of the STEM products. Uh, the last thing that I found in my research was in, when you look at what influences kids at a young age, so much of it is, is media and pop culture. And when you think about the role models for kids, especially in children's media, you have Bob the Builder, Sid the Science Kid, Handy Manny, Jimmy Neutron. Most of the builders and inventors are boys. And if there are girl inventors or builders, they're usually the nerd with the glasses with no friends. And so um, I took all of these insights and kind of forming my hypothesis for what Goldie Blocks could be. And what I ended up building was a character-driven uh, STEM play experience where the main character was a girl engineer and she'd go on, pro on adventures to solve problems and build things with common household objects to make simple machines. And the purpose was to help her friends and to make the world a better place. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm not going to talk about a particular content area in STEM, but about learning itself. So if we're trying to understand how we can start STEM learning really early in the zero to five period, we have to know something about how young brains learn. How do they take up information? So we've been doing a lot of research at the Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences in Seattle at the University of Washington using brain imaging machines that are completely safe and non-invasive for very young babies. And they're called magnetoencephalography machines, or MEG for short. They look like a hairdryer from Mars, but they're completely safe and non-invasive. So we've begun to study what are the principles by which very young children learn. I think we all know that that children in the very early period learn like sponges, but we can go beyond what your grandmother knows and say, what are the things that allow brains to be built? And a founding principle is that we really do see that brains need to be built. Babies come into the world with all of these areas of the brain ready to go, waiting for experiences. And experiences for children are not the formal experiences we think about as school formal learning experiences, but they're informal, they're playful, they're social, they're action driven, they're driven by children's passions. And when you see children in those settings and you compare brain imaging studies under which, where kids are, are interacting socially with others, either with their peers or with an adult. Something different happens in brains when the experience is social as opposed to non-social. Uh, little brains love social settings and they love social interaction. They also love action. We can see in the brain science studies now that when you give a child an experience, when you talk to them, many of these experiments come from the language area, but when they see something or hear something, even when they're very, very tiny, like seven months, the action centers of the brain are activated. The centers they would use to talk back themselves that are preparing them for action are activated as early as seven months. So the reason early experiences matter to the baby brain is that it prepares them to give back, to act back, this sort of serve and volley. The whole point of childhood is to act on the world. So it's experiences that children need. So this business of a social setting and a social context and the ability to act, this drive of the social brain uh, to be with others has a downside as well. So the fact that children, the social brain wants to belong, and belonging is defined culturally. And so we'll see in later panel discussions today, uh, work by Andy Meltzoff, and it's already been alluded to this morning, that the social brain wants to fit in. And if fitting in is a, a matter of examining how people like you are treated in the world, what roles do they assume, uh, what does society expect of people like you, 
Then we see the absorption of early stereotypes that limit aspirations, uh, that limit choices. And so we see both the upside of social learning, this powerful social brain that actually drives that early uh, seeking of experiences that the brain needs. That social drive is so potent and so um, attached to learning, but it also has the component that says, we look to see our future roles, particularly as children, uh, as evidenced by society. So if you're a girl, if you're black, if you're Hispanic, you look out to what others like you are, um, are doing. And that can have uh, a downside on, on learning. So we'll, we'll talk some more, I, I hope, about interventions that would affect that. But let's talk about the action side just a little bit again. Children are, so I think it was uh, the uh, Secretary of Education, John King, who mentioned the Nature Exploratorium uh, in a library, the idea that, that children are natural scientists. They want to tinker with things. They want to understand how they work. To get all of the foundations of uh, STEM into the brain early in development, we have to let children's natural curiosity, every child on the planet is born curious. Every child on the planet wants to act on the world and make something happen. So those are the bases. Uh, playing with objects like blocks will, and playing with water, someone mentioned, those kinds of activities will feed that brain that wants to tinker with the objects in the world and the things in the world, wants to push around uh, other individuals, I mean push them mentally, not physically, uh, to make it, to have an effect on others in the world is what children are born to do. So the social justice issues get raised by this, right? Because if the brain is waiting for opportunities to learn, and we can measure how opportunities to learn directly relate to gray matter and white matter in various areas of the brain, you relate that to language, you can relate it to STEM areas. There are areas devoted to everything. You can watch them grow, and they grow based on experiences. So the social justice issue comes when the opportunities to learn are reduced or not there. The brain is ready. If nothing's there, the brain doesn't grow in that way. You can see by the age of five huge effects of changes in the opportunities to learn in the right areas of the brain. It's just not a level playing field at the age of five when what's varied is the opportunities to learn. So that raises all of the issues that we need to discuss today about if you know that brains wait for experiences, if you know that brains are ready to learn and they learn socially and through action, then understand if that social context doesn't provide those opportunities, that brain's not going to be the same. It had the potential, but there is this sense that you can pass those opportunities. That first five years when you set the stage, we can, in the, in the realm of language, identify indelible effects of those early experiences. So it's, it's a period not to be lost and one that we need to capitalize on and understand what the components are that are needed. Uh, let's see, have I mentioned everything on the list here? I think uh, there was a good example, uh, many of the things that, that John King said about um, learning opportunities, and Liz Simons mentioned a great one last night, just saying that her childhood was full of math games. I mean, they just did that at home. Kids in Singapore just do that. Math is more integrated into their lives. And she had mentioned the ancient game in modern society, uh, shoots and ladders. But it's an ancient game that cultures invented to encourage uh, both ways of learning math. And so uh, we un need to understand how playful experiences early build the brains that ne are needed to head into school to reach every child's potential. Thank you. Um, so it's really pretty exciting to, to think about all of these um, different pieces. What we've heard here is everything from you know, the predictive uh, power of, of STEM learning for children's outcomes later, the importance of trajectories, um, the capacity that young children have, the sequencing that we um, know can um, be, be uh, learned in these very early years, um, how much identity formation is starting in these early years and has a bearing on how children learn and absorb um, different concepts within STEM, um, the social setting and the importance for this social learning. Um, so given all of that and, uh, and given also that we, we now you know, have a short amount of time Time to kind of go into our what do we not know yet? I do want to pose that question to you all. I, I um, want to spend some time, we do not have to go in order, um, really kind of pushing a little bit on given how much that really is known and still is maybe not 
fully practiced for a lot of reasons um, out there in the field, are there still some big questions hanging out there in your minds, things that we, and especially those of us in the room today and those watching on the live stream, um, really need to start pushing on. Um, so is there someone who is right now kind of at the edge of their seat, like, but we still don't know this, and wants to explain a little bit more? So I want to follow up exactly on what Pat left us. I want to follow up where Pat left us, because one of the big things that we don't know in, in learning computer science in early childhood is what happens in the brain of a young child engaging in programming. And that's huge. We have the experts and we're going to be and actually I'm just engaging in a brand new project to explore this because that's huge implications for where do we place computer science in the curriculum. We are making an assumption that computer science goes with STEM. But there is another field that might say computer science has something to do with language. Mm -hmm. And there's a language area of the brain, and there's a problem solving area of the brain. And what about if computer science really cuts across as in both? And we are putting the cart before the horse, like you say in English, right. <laughs> by assuming, or the horse before the cart, I can never get it right. But we're assuming, we're directly assuming that computer science goes with STEM and with problem solving only. And maybe, and we are going to go all full-fledged with our policies without really thinking and doing the basic research that we need to do to understand and get the evidence of what happens in the brain when we learn computer science. It might be that the language areas also get activated, and that which has, which is my hinge, and we are starting a new research project, and that has huge implications for where do we place it in the curriculum. Also, it will open up the world of diversity and inclusion, because as we heard before, you know, suddenly we're thinking of programming something more related to storytelling yeah. than only to problem solving, you know? So that's one big area that I think we really need to... Yeah, this question like of integration. To, to build on that, if I mm -hmm. could, about connections. Um, uh, I think there's two areas of connections that we're looking at. Um, the Heisen Simons Foundation has funded a dream group at the Development Research and Early Mathematics Education, and Michelle Mazako, who's here, is leading up a team who are studying what is the relationship between early math and executive function? Is one precede the other? Are they co-mutually uh, beneficial? We need to look at those connections. Another person that's here, Kim Brenneman, and I and, I and Julian, uh, Nell Duke and other colleagues have developed an interdisciplinary preschool curriculum. We have to look at not only how those kind of things uh, can be uh, appropriately um, uh, each to the benefit of the other, similar to what you're mm -hmm. saying, mm -hmm. but also how do we help teachers with this kind of massive task of learning multiple areas? It's hard enough to learn one of the STEM uh, and the like. And the, um, uh, the other area I think that's, that's other research, mm -hmm. if I could take us into that, is uh, the policy arena. How do we make some of these things happen? So we know much more than we're, we're doing. We need to figure out how we get people convinced that really people, that most early childhood educators never take a math methods course. We need several. How do we make that happen? How do we get that structurally into all the states? And then finally, across the field, how do we end the false dichotomies that are pulling STEM apart in many cases in early childhood? Play versus academic. So we're play-based. We don't do math and science. Because the image of math and science is that it belongs later. The image of math and science is you have to sit kids down and give them worksheets. Mm -hmm. These kind of false dichotomies, I think, are destructive. And so the, how we attack, attack those things and get those policies and mindsets changing, I think, is a huge challenge. Yeah, I want to I follow up on that, because I think the critical issue is how do we get uh, early childhood teachers and educators and even the leaders, the directors of the programs and the principals in the elementary schools, how do we get them to think about the importance of having the teachers and the children spend more time on science, technology, engineering, and math? Uh, last night, Liz was talking about the fact that just a couple minutes a day is on math. There's even less time on science and even less time on, on engineering and, and things like computer science. So we know that this is important, but we need to really think about how do we educate the staff, the leadership in thinking about the importance of this. And uh, as D Doug pointed out, most, most uh, 
students go through schools of education. They don't have courses in, in, in uh, math education or science education. So this is something that we have to do in some sense, like fly the plane as we're building it, as they're already in, in the field. And we're beginning to try to look at some of that, but it's, it takes a lot of time. And we find that teachers are, are frightened by doing science or frightened by doing math. And what we often do now is we send them to workshops. <laughs> workshops do something, they provide knowledge for the, for the teachers, but if you go to a workshop and you have a good time where you just think this was a waste of time, when you go back to the classroom, most educators really don't change their behavior because knowledge by itself is just not gonna be enough. What we need is a system that supports <coughs> teachers when they go back to the classroom so that the knowledge is turned into effective practice and that they're then able to reflect on that practice. So we're trying to do that in a couple projects that we're doing across the country um, with funding from the Buffett Foundation. And some of the, the, the sort of the really critical issues, there's a group in Chicago that's led by um, the University of Chicago and the Erickson Institute. There's a number of those people here now. Raise your hand so you can talk to them later on. <laughs> Uh, so, um, through the Chicago ch funding from the Chicago Trust and through the uh, University of Chicago and Erickson, we have a group that's meeting on a fairly regular basis. There's, there's a little summary in your, in your um, books there that talks about sort of what we're doing, but the basic goal is over the next year, we've been working on this for a year already, is to really tr tr address in STEM what is it that we know, what is it that we need to know, and what is STEM? Is STEM one thing? Is it multiple things? And as Doug says, we can't really treat these as four independent topics because it's gonna be overwhelming for the teachers. But on the other hand, it can't be one topic. So we really need to understand what is this and how can we get leadership and educators to really understand this is critical. So and it's not that, they're, that, that you're gonna replace other topics. It's not like you're gonna give up language or math or anything because they're all related and you can build all these other activities into things that yeah. the kids are interested in that they wanna do. And as Pat says, it helps really build their brains. Yeah, I think it would be very helpful if all educators really knew how brains do work. If some part of the educational curriculum, particularly for the early uh, educators, but for all educators, and uh, parents as well, society too, but the notion of how brains actually work and that they grow and that we feed that growth with experiences. And I don't think that's something that's in the groundwater yet. That's not something that people accept. I also agree that, that brain imaging studies would tell us things that would surprise us. Let me give you an example. We've, been, we've done one math study with our big MEG machine in college students. And what we compared is monolingual and bilingual college students who were trying to do math in their first language or their second language. And we see that when they're doing math in their first language that they work in the math uh, areas. You can see the math areas of the brain light up and they're, they're working quite intensely depending on the difficulty of the problem. When bilinguals do their, do their uh, math problems in their second language, they dip down, like you get light up in the math areas and dip down to the language areas to figure out the math fact. Do the translation, get the math facts which were stored in their original language and then come back up and then you know, produce the answer. So when teachers tell you that some of the bilingual kids are not very good in math, what's really going on is not calculation but translation. And brain imaging can show it to you. It can look at the interaction between brain areas. In fact, what we see in almost all complex problems that we look at under a MEG machine, when you get under the hood, the brain is really involved in many areas collaborate to solve a problem. Many areas collaborate to do one isolated thing. And so the more imaging studies that we can do on natural problems that kids face, not only in the very early period, but as they enter school, the more we'll be able to tease apart what are the interactions, what happens when a child tries to problem solve, what's the eureka moment look like. That would be very fun to see in a brain imaging machine. And lastly, the things that we don't know. For in the area of language and literacy, we can now connect the dots from six months to five years. We have measures at six months of age that predict language to 30 months and reading readiness at the age of five. That's phenomenal. Uh, and so if you can do that kind of predict, we can just show these are the experiences that kids have to have. We can't do that so well in the STEM areas. You know, what is gonna feed computer science? What's gonna feed uh, math? What are the efficacious experiences and how, what it, brain areas do those uh, experiences change? So the more we can do to look at the exploratory fun activities that kids naturally have a passion for, how do those grow particular brain areas? That will help us connect the dots for any one of these disciplines heading towards the age of five. 
Um, One of the things that I'm still trying to figure out is, uh, because I think it's easy to come up with a lot of ways to make STEM fun and accessible to kids, uh, and I think all of us in this room have been able to come up with ways. I think that demystifying it for educators and parents is a huge issue that um, it becomes a huge block. And it's funny, I think about my mom. Uh, when I told her I was going to major in engineering, she said, ew, why? <laughs> you know, and I told her recently I was going to learn um, coding myself, she's like, ugh, like I would, I can, I can barely use a computer, you know, and and it's those subtle messages that you hear from your role models early on, growing up, that start to make it less and less accessible to you. And so, how do we change that? How do we make people, um, adults, realize that engineering isn't just for geniuses, and that they don't need to be afraid of it? And in fact, they could learn some of it too. And it's fun to think about from the uh, early childhood development standpoint because you've got to simplify it. Uh, for that age group anyway. So if you're simplifying it for them, you can simplify it for the parents and educators and actually get them kind of relearning it or learning it for the first time. So what's interesting, it strikes me as, as we're talking here in terms of pushing on you know, what we don't know, what we want to find out, that there are a lot of connections into culture and um, into integrating um, what we know about language, literacy, social learning with all of these pieces. Let me. Let me take it um, maybe even a step deeper then. It, it strikes me that a really big challenge is that integration and figuring out what are the research studies that can get you to, to learn more, and then to do it in a way that's developmentally informed, since you know, we were talking about, say, maybe what an 18-month-old or a two-year-old would want or need um, might be quite different than what our, our four-year-olds may need in a, in a classroom setting, and certainly what our uh, students in our kindergarten and first grade classrooms need. So um, I've got just a couple of minutes, we'll make this maybe one of our last questions, and then we'll take some questions from our, our audience here. But are there some things that we need to be asking in the research field that focus in more on some of these stages of development in children's lives? What I think is, is so in, it, great about this kind of notion of learning trajectories is it really does go down to birth and, and, yeah. and, and move up. And, as you look at the development of these uh, kids, and it can be through brain imaging, but a lot can be done by observing kids and talking to kids too, um, we really know these different kind of levels from, from the get-go and what kind of building experiences and STEM experience with blocks and everything leads to the kind of spatial uh, uh, foundations of later thinking and the kind of experiences that, that lead on. And that's so important because when you're in a preschool or in a kindergarten, you are going to have kids at a two to three wide year age span along those developmental levels. And it's so important to kids, especially kids at each end of that grade span, kids could come in with a, a real deficit of experiences, not ability, not intelligence, but just experiences. You can get down to their level. We always talk about start where the child is. Everybody says that. But if right. you don't know the developmental levels right. in math and science, you don't know where the child is, and you don't know what the nef next level is to, to, to build that up. So I think right. that's really important. So you know, for the last 10 years, I would say we, have, we are pretty much in a place where we understand if we start teaching children computer you know, programming and computational thinking using developmentally appropriate tools. That's really important, because they need to be tangible. They need to be physical. It's not your old school computer science class. Uh, we have developed and we have, you know, we've done thousands and thousands of kids uh, in the U.S. and also international and, and teachers and everything. Well, we, have, we are ready to have a scope and sequence of how we develop curriculum for four-year-olds all the way to second grade. Well, we have, you know, incrementally, for example, we know that if we, by, you know, by kindergarten, we can start introducing concepts such as repeat loops, which is multiplication. And so... Suddenly, these kids are, multipli are doing multiplication, but we're not telling them they're doing multiplication. They're using a repeat loop with very tangible blocks. And then by second grade, they're really using more sophisticated ifs and things like that kind of loops, and then that can lead to a reprogram. So in, in our field of computer science in early childhood education, I say we are there in terms of building curriculum pre-K to two. What we don't know yet is how, so developmentally, how these, because at the end, it's about thinking. Right, right. Yeah. How this translates, how the links, and if we're talking about thinking, we're talking about integration. And experiences don't come compartmentalized into letters. Experiences come all together. So how we develop the measures, how we develop the research mechanisms 
to really understand how this way of thinking that, in this case, computer science facilitates by integrating, by allowing us to do what early childhood education always do, which is integrated curriculum, play-based, good curriculum. That's all we need to do. But then how do we develop the research methods to understand what's happening? Yeah. And what is yeah. the control group? The world who's not programming. You know. so, <laughs> so before we keep going, why not, we'll start um, getting some questions in. And then for others who might want to respond to that, you can maybe weave them into your answers. Um, and um, so I want, want you all to um, raise your hand to, to ask a question. It certainly state um, who you are and where you're coming from, but make sure it's a question. We don't have a lot of time for longer um, statements right now. Um, and, and just before we do that, I do want to just signal that these questions about you know, the research to come are something that are very much on our mind at New America um, in the Education Policy Program and at the Joan Gans Cooney Center and Michael Levine's shop. And, and uh, at the end of May and early June, we'll be having a forum. It's one of the commitments that's noted. Um, at this event, and we're looking forward to hearing much more from a lot of you about what we need in our next kind of research to action agenda. So uh, let's take a minute now to, to, to hear from you and find out what you're interested in. I'll go ahead maybe with Sam, if you can stand up there. Hi, and then. I'm Sam Wayne. I uh, uh, run an organization called Pride Washington in Seattle. I'm, uh, I'm from Missouri. I'm a medical student. Um, I wonder what research there is Great. And I'll just repeat the question um, for those who are listening live stream. It's around whether there's any research on um, parental attitudes regarding STEM in early learning and maybe what might be done to, to change those. So um, I'm involved in a project with Kim Brenneman, who's here, and, and uh, uh, Betsy Zand sitting there in the corner. It's actually a project, and it's a project that's being done in Boston. And uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to create homeschool connections that are bi-directional. Typically what ends up happening with a program is the program gets developed, it's handed to the teachers, and the teachers think of some activities to send home to the parents. What we're doing is we're focusing on the parents directly, and we've spent a fair amount of time working with parents, and we're doing this in, in, in two immigrant dual language learning populations. One is an Hispanic population in Boston, and the other is a, is a Chinese population. And we're not trying to create a, a canned curriculum, but we're trying to create a process in which parents have a voice, and they think about what is the science and what is, what is the engineering, the technology, and the math that is happening in their home, that's happening in their neighborhood, and how can they take advantage of that? And we actually spent a year working with, uh, having a group work just with the parents, another work group just work with the teachers, and then when they both felt competent, bring them together and begin to have interchanges. What our, was done in Head Start, and what our Head Start teachers ended up reporting was that they're required to have parent involvement meetings. They have to feed the parents, they bring the parents in, they talk to them, tell them something, the parents eat, they listen, and they leave. And what's happening now is their dialogues, the food is there, but you know it's not required, and when the session is over, people don't want to leave because the parents now feel that they have a voice and, that we're, and they're seeing that what they're doing at home is now happening in, in the classroom, and you now have that connection that's bi-directional. I was made aware of a study recently commissioned by the Girl Scouts where they found that um, girls whose fathers encouraged them in STEM uh, tended to show more interest. I don't know about the moms, but uh, that was something really interesting to me. It's an equity issue too, right? Because it tends to be, there's always exceptions, but on average the research shows that um, uh, higher resource community parents believe they should be doing STEM things with kids. Lower resource communities tend to believe it's the job of the school, and if I do something, I'll mess it up. Multiple projects, our own and many others in mathematics, show that if you give the parents resources, including bedtime math and including um, uh, how to use books and including manipulatives and simple activities to do at home. You can change that kind of perspective and it's an unfortunate perspective that can be made much more productive. I, I think it's very critical, these points about how to educate parents, uh, how to coach parents to understand the power they have over that developing brain and give them the power in a way that doesn't make them feel as though you have to buy fancy books and toys and expensive stuff, but it's really about them. 
It's really about them and the experiences they can provide. I think we don't know enough about methods to coach parents. Uh, we're just starting a project funded by the Overdeck uh, Foundation to give us a little clue as to how parents might be coached uh, to change <coughs> behaviors at home with regard to language. And so we're very excited about what we might learn because I think the principles are going to be very general with regard to how do parents resist or do parents feel as though, oh, that's a leg up on what I can do. We're hoping let's, a ladder. Let's take one more. Let's, let's, let's go to audience again and make sure we can get in at least one more question here. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. And so, so the question, just to repeat it for all, is t it's, a, it's continuing on this parental line of questioning around um, what parent parents can know and do, um, just how parents can kind of feel confidence and, and know that their children are on track and that they have the, the resources at their mm -hmm. disposal. Um, National Counselor Teaches Mathematics has a lot of resources on the, uh, their website for parents, which is an interesting thing. We've just been funded uh, a while ago by the Heisen Simons Foundation to build a free website that'll show video of kids from infancy up and what their developmental levels and their thinking of math and then tie that to activities like our learning trajectories always do. So uh, hopefully next fall or spring we'll have something that that you can look at on that. So for us, so we, we've done, we because we follow this literacy model and we know that family literacy has been you know, leading the way here. So we use for computer science the same idea. So actually if you go to scratch.org, which is our website for Scratch, which is free, you can find lots of resources for parents. We do believe that learning computation, I think it starts at home before they even get to school, before they even have an iPad. Uh, and so we have lots of resources out there for parents that you can access. We have a, actually a protocol because we create these Scratch Junior Family Nights where parents and children come together to learn coding together. And by coding, some activities are on the screen, some activities are off the screen because it's really a way of thinking. But in order to answer to insecurities, I would say that you start by asking a question to your child. And we really follow and provide experiences just the same way that you do with language. So you start talking with your baby even though the baby cannot <laughs> understand. Okay. So the same is in, the, in this field, at least in what I know, which is computer science, you start pointing out activities that require sequencing and activities where order matters. And you uh, start pointing out steps. Well, in order to brush your teeth, how many steps did you take? And you usually what happens is at the beginning, a child would say, well, there's three steps. I went to the bathroom, I brushed my teeth, I came back. And our research shows that after they've been exposed to a curriculum on programming, they will have 100 steps, for example, as they get older, because they are able to decompose a problem. There you have computational thinking without uh, going into uses of computers. One messaging system that I think shows real promise is something called Vroom, and created by the Bezos Family Foundation. And it's available on a smartphone, and it gives parental tips. These are uh, focused on uh, language and general principles about learning. And then on the back of the, so the message, if you have the physical card, has a, a tip for the parent. And on the back side, a, a, kind of the brain basis of why would, you, why would you do that to your child. So I think looking into things like that that are available on a smartphone, which everybody has, not everybody has iPads and computers, but the smartphone is probably going to be a vehicle for short messages that parents can take advantage of, things they can do. That's worth looking into. So uh, one thing, oh, uh, one thing I'll just bring up real quick is um, at Goldie Blocks, we get this question all the time from parents who, you know, we love your toys, but what else can we do? And so um, we have about a quarter million fans on Facebook, mostly moms and dads, and a lot of teachers. And so every day we post multiple articles that 
answer this question. We curate the content and we try and, and provide it. So we pull it from all over the internet and uh, there's a good kind of lively conversation there. So that's one place to go look for tips. Okay, parents, yes. So our, our professional development model for teachers is that they need to acquire knowledge of what, of what they're going to teach. They need to be able to turn that knowledge into practice and have help doing that and be able to then reflect on the effectiveness of that practice. And there are all sorts of resources like creating communities of practice, you know, talking to, to um, other parents, other teachers. And we find for STEM, teachers uh, also have that sort of lack of self-confidence. But when, when you uh, tell them, you don't have to know the answer to begin with. When the children ask you a question, that's a great question. How can we learn together and answer that question together? And there's a lot of resources. So you know, if you get parents to understand that learning is not just the, for, what the, for their child, that they also can be learning with their child, the child really appreciates that. And there's resources and ways to sort of develop an understanding. And then what ends up happening, you see over time that you, the, the, the teachers and the parents, when you provide that same professional development, begin to develop self-confidence. They feel, I can do this. And what motivates them to continue is they see the big difference that it makes in their children. Well, I've been asked, I'm going to wrap up. This has been a really fabulous conversation. Please um, join me in giving our panelists a round of applause.